In regard to scientific NRINs or new religious movements, scientific new religious movements, and new religious samples of new religious movements in Africa, particularly Kenya, I will cite quite a number of examples and even address the moral uh, the moral challenge, the moral challenge in this. Um, in other words, are there all moral underpinnings? Are, moral, are there moral challenges in addressing new religious movement, whether in Europe or in Africa? Whether in Eastern Europe or in Africa or any part of the world, I want us to look at it. But I'll start by talking about scientific NRMs so that we may capture the Eastern and the, the Western understanding of new religious movements. Many new religious movements or NRMs claim to be not religions. They don't claim to be religions at all, but rather scientific truth that has not yet been acknowledged or discovered by the official scientific community. In the search for authority for new teachings, certain NRMs have thus tapped into what is arguably the most powerful form of legitimizing discourse in the modern world, that is uh, science. They have tapped science into their religious discourses. Some people or some groups have claimed scientific proof for yoga and meditation. And other NRMs have developed in the West under the umbrella of self-proclaimed scientific validity. Validity. A more recent scientific NRM group is Heaven's Gate, uh, the creation of Marshall Apple White, who preferred to call himself Do. Apple White declared that he uh, and his female partner, T.I., were really representatives from another world, which he referred to as the evolutionary level above human. Claiming to have come to earth once before in the figure of Jesus, Apple White asserted that the kingdom of heaven taught by Apple White stroke Christ was a real one. Physical place inhabited by highly evolved beings. So he talked about the physical being, the physical appearance of the kingdom of heaven, and he called himself Jesus. He called himself Christ, Jesus Christ. He went on to argue that earth was a garden in which human beings had been planted. You can see how he played around with the Genesis uh, story of creation by saying the earth that is what Apple White argued that earth was a garden in which human, human beings had been planted. By these superior space beings, some such plants could hope to mature and further evolve into members of the level above human. But only if they systematically shed off send off all vestiges of their humanity, including sexuality. Some members of the group, this group I've mentioned to you, Heaven's Gate, okay, which was a creation of a man by name Marshall Apple White, is the one who created the Heaven's Gate. They actually castrated themselves. Why? Uh, they castrated themselves um, in order to further this end that we send off all vestiges of the, our humanity in order 
to be able to make this garden of heaven, the earth, good. Okay? Now, formed originally in 1970s, this so-called Heaven's Gate group of new religious movements settled in the San Diego, California area in America in 1996, where it supported itself by creating worldwide websites for internet users. You see now, when the internet comes now, they make use of it to propagate this, to me, heretical ideology about this uh, scientific way of addressing religion. Okay? In March 1997, April White declared that the appearance of Comet Hale Bob signaled the arrival of a spaceship, spaceship sent to, to gather up the mature plants before the impeding spreading over of the garden. That is the end of the world. And the remaining 39 members of the group committed suicide in order to join the Aryan community in outer space. You can see they committed suicide. They killed themselves in order to join the Aryan community in outer space. You can see the extremism of new religious movements. And if we are not careful, we will find ourselves in Africa, in Africa today in the same, same environment where women spend all their time, their time in the pastor's houses, cooking for them, sometimes washing their feet, and they say that is the way of God, and their families are dying. Okay, another example. Theosophy is a scientific movement. Let's talk about Theosophy specifically. This group calling itself Theosophy. Theo and Sophie. Theosophy, were, which is occult movement originated, originating in the 19th century, with roots that can be traced to ancient Gnosticism and Neoplatonism. The term Theosophy derived from the Greek Theos and Sophia wisdom is generally understood to mean divine wisdom, theosophy, divine wisdom. Now, forms of this doctrine were held in antiquity by people called Manchaeans, a group called Manchaeans, who were followers of a man by name Mani, an Iranian dualistic sect, and in the Middle Ages by two groups of dualist heretics, the Bogomis and in Bulgaria and the Byzantine Empire and Kadari in southern France and Italy. Now, in modern times, theosophical views have been held by Rosicrucians, Rosicrucians and by speculative Freemasons. The international New Age movement of the 1970s and 80s originated among independent uh, theosophical groups in the United Kingdom. So you can see uh, theosophists are not just the Middle East. They are there in the UK. Okay? And all that. You can look at the beliefs. We can't exhaust them now. So I can just make a few uh, samples. The various forms of theosophical speculation have certain common characteristics. The first is an emphasis on mystical experience. Theosophical writers hold that there is a deep spiritual reality and that direct contact with that reality, that reality can be established through intuition or instinctively or not reasoning, or not is reasoning. You use in, in, instinct, not reasoning. So you can get that reality by instinct, not reasoning. Or me, through meditation, that is focusing the mind on a particular object, 
on liberation or some other state transcending normal human consciousness. You see now when religion kills reasoning and employs instinct, it is dangerous. They don't say Holy Spirit here. The us will talk about instinct should tell you, conscience should tell you, but they talk about not conscience but instinct as a religious way of making judgment. Theosophists also emphasize esoteric doctrine. And you see, esoteric doctrine is a, uh, it means, esoteric first means uh, that which is understood by only a chosen few. Esoteric. An esoteric person would have select interest shared by a few others and would speak in big or rarely, rarely used ones that would typically go over the hands of the people he she converses with. So these esoteric people with esoteric leadership, the chosen few status, okay, with selected people who know what this big man want to talk about. You see, we come back to the, uh, the big man syndrome, which we should consider in some Afro-Pentecostal outfits where we have big men man syndrome who talks like a god so in this theosophy uh, movement their beliefs are very close to some element of afro pentecostalism and uh, we are not trying to be dismissive and say every afro pentecostal outfit is new religious movement some are even conventional religious movements but there are those things that you see there finally for today, theosophy displays a characteristic preference for monism. Okay? Monism, the view that reality is constituted of one principle or one substance, such as mind or spirit. You see, that dichotomization, mind or spirit, or rather, uh, reality is conceived through one way, one principle, mind or spirit. Although theosophists recognize the basic distinctions between the phenomenal world and the higher spiritual reality and between the human and the divine, which suggest dualism, most theosophists also affirm an overarching, or encompassing unity that subsumes all differentiation. Associated with their Monism are the beliefs that God is utterly transcendent and impersonal, that creation is a product of spiritual emanations from God, and that humans are sparks of the divine trapped in that material world which desire to return to their spiritual home. So those are some of the things that you find with the theosophy. Of course, you can go historical and say, it began in 1875, Theosophy as a movement began in 1875, it was begun by Helen Bravatsky who died uh, in 1981, was born 1831, so you can see she lived for 60 years, 1831 died in 1891, she lived for 60 years. Another one is Henry Steele Ocott who lived it between 1832 and died in 1907. And William Quinn Judge, who lived between 1851 and died in 1896. Now, a Russian aristocrat, Bravatsky, immigrated to the United States in 1873. After many years of travel and standing in Europe and the Middle East, Ocott, an American lawyer, newspaper man, and student of spiritualism, a 19th century movement based on the belief that the living can contact the dead, soon fell under her sway and became the society's president in 1875. They moved to India in 1878, eventually settling in India near Mandras, which still serves as the international headquarters of the Osophie Society. 
Branch societies were established throughout India and in the major cities of Europe and North America. A second organization, the esoteric section of the Theosophy Society, was established in London in 1888 to practice occultism and to facilitate the movement of the society's members to a higher level of consciousness. Bravatsky also wrote the two volume books, Isis Unveiled. Number two, she also wrote the book, she also wrote the book, uh, this book, you should remember the book she also wrote, that is The Secret Doctrine, also in two volumes in 1888, and other works that are recognized as classic expositions of Theosophical Doctrine. Now, the basic goals of the Theosophical Society are enunciated in the so-called three objects. That is, to form a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or color, to encourage the study of comparative religion, philosophy, and science, and to investigate unexplained laws of nature and the powers latent in human beings. And in pursuing uh, these objectives, the society, the Theosophy Society, has been a major conduit for Eastern teachers moving to the West and a starting point for many archaic teachers and movements. Now, when you go to the East, the Eastern part of the world, the East, new religious movement in the East, you find that NRNs have appeared in in Southeast Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia, I've said South Asia, East Asia, and Southeast Asia since the mid 19th century. While some of these religious movements have remained small and limited in influence, others have grown quite large and have played important roles in the social, economic, and political development of their respective nations or religions. While new religions have appeared frequently throughout Asian history, there are important differences between those that developed before and after the mid 19th century. Religious movements that emerged after 1850 reflect the impact of the West of Western forms of political, economic, and cultural imperialism. From the 19th century onward, the newly industrialized and expansionist West and advanced into Asia for God, glory, and God. Western nations secure in this sense of political, military, economic, and cultural superiority and armed with either an expansionist, Protestant, or Roman Catholic faith frequently sent missionaries as the vanguard of later imperialist ventures. Some areas in South and Southeast Asia, India for instance, Vietnam, along with Laos and Cambodia, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines, were taken outright and made to fit into Ranja European and American colonial networks. Even those areas that were not controlled directly by the West, such as China, Japan, and Korea, felt its influence in the form of imposed unequal treaties or carefully applied military pressure. The new religious movements that evolved in this social, political, and cultural environment were either direct reactions against Western imperialism, taking the form of reinvention of a non of a non tradition or spiritual synthesis of Western and Asian belief systems. These new religions were thus designated to serve both as an answer and as an alternative to the spreading Westernization, secularization, individualism, and materialism occurring within Asian cultures. Now, concerning new religious movements in African context, 
we may ask, is, is it a moral concern? Is there any moral concern in new religious movement in African context? Is the moral issue the major concern in Afro-Pentecostalism in generally new religious movement in Africa? Now, take the case of Karenga Church, Karenga Churches in Central Kenya. These are African instituted churches that began in Central Kenya since 1920s after theo-cultural differences with the European missionary leaderships who had no room for African culture. In essence, all the African instituted churches who insisted on gospel and culture and dialogue as opposed to the total erasing of African culture can be clustered within the new religious movement. This does not mean that all NRMs are heretical and or have false religious teachings. As a matter of fact, some of these NRMs have sound theological teachings and offer apt theology of inculturation. As we shall see, or as we have already noted so far, these theocultural and doctrinal differences between the newly converted African Christians went hand in hand with African nationalism, African politicking, and all that. Take the case of the female circumcision debate. The campaign against female circumcision, otherwise called female genital mutilation, FGM, by the Church of Scotland Mission in 1906. At first, it was in line with the missionaries' dream of changing the Kikui world view radically. From the outset, the arguments that were advanced against the female circumcision were that it was medically harmful. But by the mid-1920s, the campaign had included boy circumcisions as well. In this dismissal of female circumcision, the missionaries considered female circumcision as punitive, impulsive, unchristian, and medically unnecessary. As for the boy circumcision, the European settlers described it as psychologically harmful and economically bad. Because when they go for these colleges of circumcision, they take a month to, to heal, the settlers would have wanted them to work in their farms, in their white highlands. But when they stay there for that long, undergoing the traditional circumcision where they are taken uh, into cold livers, at 4 a.m. in the morning, so that when they are being operated on, pain was not too much, though it was still there. The Cetra farmer, European farmers, will not see the economic viability of these colleges of circumcision. As Jomo Kenyatta notes, the Kikuyu converts to Christianity were persuaded to believe that female circumcision, the dances, the songs, and lichus associated with it called Mambura, Mambura, or divine services, were evil, immoral, and ungodly. Consequently, biblical passages were quoted extensively, especially Paul's letters to the Romans and the Galatians, that taught that the circumcision of the heart was more important than that of the body, as Galatians 5.2, Romans 2.25, and Romans 2.29, and 1 Corinthians 7.19 teaches. Interestingly, the Kikuyu or the African Christians in Central Kenya continued circumcising their daughters secretly, secretly, and by 1910, the missionaries had become convinced that an African who had passed the age of puberty and who was left in his, in his accustomed environment could never become more than a nominal Christian. Because if you have undergone the right of circumcision, you can't be a good Christian. That is how they felt. Of course, they themselves could have prayed an extreme position. And uh, the other Africans had also prayed another extreme position, almost uh, not appreciating the cultural dynamism. Uh, also, the Europeans not appreciating that God forgives even people who have done bad things. And as female circumcision debate and debate led on in Kikuyurat, a committee which was set up in Tomotomo drafted a resolution demanding that 
female circumcision be abolished and that Christians should not participate in politics. Consequently, they split the church in two, into two theologically irreconcilable groups. Those who supported the missionaries' theological position of keeping culture and politics out of religion came to be known as Agekoyo Akalinga or Kikuyu Cultural Nationalist, while those who supported the missionaries' demand were known as Agekoyo Akirole, or meaning fingerprint or abolitionist Kikuyu. This spirit of the church at Tomotomo and the rest of central Kenya led to similar disturbances disturbances in the rest of central Kenya. That is Kijambe, Kamboi and Kikuyu in Kikuyu and other places in Muranga. In particular, the Agikuyu Akarenga, the cultural nationalist, attacked African independent uh, mission or African AIM, African Inland Mission Church and GMS missions at Kihomboine, Muranga in 1923. Further, African Christian teachers were also attacked and abused, mocked, insulted, thereby heightening the hostilities between missionaries and the, the local people. Additionally, the Kikuyu Christians were urged to continue circumcising their daughters. Now, all these debates can't get into them. Now, going to 1930, you see the Mudrebo dance, which became a major factor in central Kenya, Kenya's NRMs. The eruption of gospel culture conflict, which was basically evangelical versus African indigenous religion, and to an extent, a conflict, a conflict between European evangelical Christianity versus African indigenous Christianity, was clearly seen after the African nationalistic zeal was incorporated in these discourses. So also politics, culture uh, came in to pray and, you know, made this uh, religious, new religious movement in central Kenya in 1920s, now, now we enter 1929 when Mudrigo dance comes with a lot of force. It's a dance that mocked the westernization, Christian version, western version of Christianity in Africa, the missionary Christianity, European Christianity as it was presented. Although you, one can argue that there is attempt, an attempt at inculturation, they also the Africans also had a very rigid way of addressing culture, failing to understand the dynamism of culture and assuming culture is perfect. Yet, gospel cannot imprison culture, neither can culture imprison the gospel. So dialogue is the only key. And these people refused to allow dialogue to take place. So Mudrego dance ridiculed the missionaries, the colonial authorities, and the uncircumcised girls were insulted through the song. Mudrigo dance or song was followed by the rise of the Aradid or dreamers and seers, adherents, the establishment of Kikuyu independent churches and schools belonging to African people, and the Aregi, anti, meaning anti evangelicals exodus to these new churches. With the central Kenyan getting divided into two irreconcilable groups, that is, pro evangelicals. Hence, the cultural abolitionists or Kirole minority and the cultural nationalists or Kalenga majority. Mudrigo dance became the unifying group. The dance was first sung at Dogoto, Kiambu, where the evangelical Presbyterians under the Reverend Dr. Ada and promoted evangelical Christianity very, very strongly. For failure to be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to anger, as James 1 19 says, the evangelicals had provoked the anger of the majority Kalinga nationalists by refusing to, to listen to them, who now and now who had to night through the new dance. And they went on to form independent churches such as AIPCA, African Orthodox Church, and so on and so forth. So uh, you may say today, the NRM through African initiated churches in central Kenya, they have changed a lot. I don't think the issue of female circumcision is given prominence as it was. I don't think there is any major conflict between the Karenga Kikuyu and the Kirole Kikuyu. I don't think it is that big. Although the time of Mau Mau, the, the so-called uh, Karenga, uh, the, the cultural nationalists or the Karengas, went as freedom fighters. And the Kiroles, the, the, the Kusoma or the Kusoma Kikuyu became 
more or less the collaborators with the European uh, uh, colonial government. Uh, you cannot say it is there today in a strong way as it was. Uh, it is not there at all. Uh, or a semblance of it. So we look at this and arrives in central Kenya how they brought in the, the, the juxtaposed religion and politics and how others felt religion and politics should be avoided, at least for Africans. Yet they themselves were Calvinists. Followers of John Calvin's teaching, the reformer, the one of the reformers with Matt, of the church with Martin Luther and Ulrich Zwingli. And Calvin, John Calvin, uh, emphasized on the good relationship between church and state. But the same, ironically, the same Calvinist uh, European evangelicals were telling Africans, don't mix African nationalism or African politics with the religion. And so that was more or less what made the fall of the two groups. Of course, we have mentioned the emergency of a rather group, the coming of the prophets or Aroti prophets or the dreamers and all that. Now, the last topic to look at is uh, Afro-Pentecostalism and the moral question. I should say this, the moral question among Afro-Pentecostals has always manifested itself through marital infidelity, spouse warping, poor leadership structures, con artistry, financial exploitation of the poor, faking miracles, and skilled populist sermons, among others. Okay? Um, you can also say that there is a lot of uh, immoral conduct, even when you look at how um, some of them uh, handle their religious outfits, such that some Af Afro-Pentecostals now appear uh, Celtic, sectarian, okay, or generally new religious movement because of the way they conduct their religious discourses. I think I was a student of new religious movement and a sociologist of religion is to study these phenomenon that obtains there and we shall be able to tell which one is going astray. The other one is, even when we say all these things about new religious movement, particularly in Kenya and Africa at lunch, we should appreciate that these are not simple people. Some are very conventional and very good. Some are very influential. Generally, the NRIMs in Kenya, they are very influential in Africa. They are very influential. Particularly in the 21st century, there is a lot of um, huge influence. But the pockets of infidelity, pockets of immorality, the immoral dimension, they are there when you listen to those people who are making women to wash their feet, to spend all their time and abandon their families. Those who are faking miracles, we have noted them, and there's a lot of all that. But that could be a drop in the ocean, or a tiny drop in a big ocean of religiosity in Africa. Most are good, quite a number are good. Ours is to look at such things, the background that give room to it, the way it is vetted, the way they appoint their leadership, the way they register of society, registers without putting, uh, you know, a caveat somewhere or looking for a body to advise him. You just register religious groups without uh, ensuring that they are vetted properly. So in concluding this, we should hasten to say that uh, um, we should be careful when people embezzle public funds Okay, then the children deny children conventional medicine in the name of religion. We should be very careful when there's child trafficking, wife swapping, eh, misreading hermeneutics, okay, skilled populist salmon. We should be very careful and we should be able to be the giraffes of society. You can see uh, the case of Mirka Modoni's uh, founded church, the refined gospel Christian church, where she even around her husband to take a second wife when she was a barren woman herself. So they found in this church. It is still there in, in Kikuyu, Kiambu. But you can see how the extent to which they can employ African uh, indigenous tr uh, trends to, to, to incorporate it in Christianity. Hence, these are new religious movements. 
the issue is the mercurial characteristics whereby there are things that they do that ordinary and uh, religious outfits they will not do uh, if it's a, for example a christian church may not go for polygamy but they, we are not saying that oh I love polygamy. you need to stand it case by case we need to study it so that we can understand the phenomenon of real religious movement in matters to do with the sin money god's nature the cross they have different dimension of looking at it environment ecumenism use of egalities uh -huh. and also the influence they have you can see some are getting nominated in as mcas in the parliament some are even getting erected all these things they are happening they are happening maybe that is where we stop there unless there's a comment uh we may not continue with the new religious movement we have given you so many examples that you can go through but we have done the big part we we'll look at it maybe much later after after uh, after once we shall look at the the broad influence that they may have the positive impact they may have how best we can make use of them okay this is where we want to stop there that's where we want to stop